This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. If I tell you the inequities we have in our society, we have children in Santa Barbara that have never seen the ocean. We have children that don't know how to swim or ride a bike. And we don't think we have de facto segregation baloney. It's all Hispanic. $7,200 a year per student for Franklin School. Montecito Union, $28,000 a year of state funding per student. We are a society that are neglecting our children, our have-nots. The center is the customer. They're the ones who are paying for everything. I just saw this as, oh my God, this is like my chance. Quarter of a million dollars, it was almost surreal. You can't just cut out one person in the supply chain in order to solve the problem. Those are the kind of people you want. You respect them, their integrity, their intelligence, their ability, their can-do attitude, hard work. All right, welcome to the second installment of UC Santa Barbara Distinguished Speaker Series. I'm John Greathouse. You can follow me on Twitter, at John Greathouse. We have a fantastic guest tonight, someone that is known worldwide and has had a huge impact globally, um, and I'm proud to say um, a huge impact on our uh, community here in Southern California, um, in the Central Coast. Paul Orfila is with us tonight. Paul, as you guys know, was the founder of Kinko's. In 1970, just mere steps from where we are right now in UC Santa Barbara, Paul opened the world's first Kinko's. And that world's first Kinko's was so huge that they had to roll the copy around on the sidewalk to use it because there wasn't room inside the store. From those humble beginnings, the company grew to over 35,000, excuse me, 23,000 employees. It was purchased by FedEx in 2004, and there are currently over 1,900 locations worldwide. Now that's a great story in and of itself, worthy of, of certainly of our speaker series, but what makes, what makes Paul so interesting is his journey was very unconventional. And Paul's success can be traced directly back to the culture that he established with his employees and the fact that he didn't just follow conventional wisdom. It wasn't just sort of the Jack Welch school of business, he had his Paul Orfila school of business and it worked, uh, worked wonders. In fact, the culture that he created was so healthy, innovations came up routinely from the store level. People that were working in the stores were coming up with ideas that were then later implemented across the board and had a huge impact on the business. One of the reasons that happened was Paul would actually go out into the stores. He wouldn't sit behind a desk and read reports and ask two or three people what was going on. He would go out into the stores and find out what was going on from the people that were working in the stores. The culture was so strong, it was cited by a number of, company, a number of magazines uh, as a great place to work, including Fortune Magazine for four years in a row, uh, naming it one of the uh, top 100 companies in America to work for. Paul's also an author. I highly recommend his book, Copy This, Lessons from a Hyperactic Dyslexic turned, Who Turned a Bright Idea into One of America's Best Companies. And I think he wrote that just to see if I could read that. Um, makes me feel a bit dyslexic. It's actually a great, it's a great book. It's a worthy read. It's really good. Um, and Paul is just so honest about the things that they did well in the, in the things that worked, as well as the things that didn't work and the mistakes they made along the way. Um, well worth it. Paul has written two other books, uh, including The Entrepreneurial Investor and $2 billion in Nichols. So Paul likes to refer to his retirement as being repurposed. He's now involved in a number of uh, business ventures, as well as philanthropic ventures. We're going to talk a little bit about his philosophy on philanthropy. It's, it's wonderful. It's very similar to his philosophy about entrepreneurship. He doesn't see a big divide between those two worlds. Through the Orfila Foundation, Paul and his family have made huge contributions, again, nationwide uh, and also right here in our own uh, South Coast, uh, South Southern California community. Uh, the, the, the foundation focused on three areas, education, youth development, and critical community needs, uh, which included school uh, food programs as well as disaster readiness for our community. So Paul likes to say that entrepreneurship is not about owning a business, it's about owning your life. I love that philosophy, and I can't wait to hear more of it. Let's welcome Paul to our class. Welcome. 
Good to see you. How are you? Well, thanks for coming. I know you get a lot of opportunities to do this sort of thing, so we're honored that you took this opportunity. So I want to start out with um, something that you've said that I think is germane, it's germane to everyone, but especially young people sitting here as well as people all over the world that are watching us. You said you think that every young person should experience the combination of being bored and poor. And you felt like that combination that you experienced before Kinko's really got up and running, you took a backpacking trip, you went, you did some traveling. Tell us a little bit about that philosophy and how your trip in 1970 really shaped what Kinko's became. Uh, boredom, very important. What's important about boredom is a child sets their own agenda and they say to themselves, this interests me. What we're doing with children with this preoccupation of busy, 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 is they don't have a chance to reflect and say, this really is a subject I like. Now, I remember as a child, if I walked to school all by myself, I told you this before, I felt like people will think I have no friends. I'm by myself. I should be in a group. Nowadays, you have this phone. And you're always looking at it like it's a friend. And uh, there's something about being with yourself and reflecting and saying, what the hell is really going on? And I think we're... We're losing with this constant preoccupation with busy, busy, busy. Yep. And busyness is not your friend. Anxiety and ambition are the best of friends. So boredom is very important. And uh, unfortunately, we're robbing our children of boring experiences. You have to figure out a way to entertain yourself. What was the second part of the question? I think, I'll just touch upon that for a second. I think there's a fear of boredom in our society. I, I went running today, and I stopped running with music, and I stopped about a year and a half ago. And it was hard at first. It was just like, oh my god, I hate this. Like I don't, I've got to do, it. I've got to get my music back. And then once I did it for a while, like I noticed it today. I just got into almost like a, when you swim. I used to do a lot of swimming. You get into a little bit of a zen state that you don't get into when you're rocking out to music and you're exercising. So I, I agree with you, freeing that mind, freeing your mind, and letting your thoughts kind of wander. What I like to do was I used to run, say three, four miles that way, and walk back. Walk back. And the thinking was just so clear. Right. And also, everybody wants this. What are you taking notes for? There's nothing earth shattering. <laughs> well, they have to. They have to write a paper. But well, just remember what I'm saying. <laughs> but I, I, I'm opposed to note taking. I just think that you don't remember what you learn. Okay. So but put your laptops away, guys. Uh, there's everybody wants this, that, and the other uh, of natural. But what's more natural than a good night's sleep? And sleeping is the elixir of learning. Yep. Uh, what you learn in the daytime gets imprinted at night with your synopsis. And those of you that are depriving yourself of a good night's sleep, you're missing out on what is important in life. It's a very important exercise. Uh, my mom only cared about two things. School wasn't one of them. <laughs> she cared about, are you saving your money and are you sleeping? Nice. And those are the two things she cared about. Yep. Well, speaking uh, of money, the other part of that quote was, Bored and poor. So how did being bored and poor impact? Kinko's? I went to Europe, and I saw these people going to the Hilton Hotel, and I thought, God, how can I ever afford that? Right. And then I used to look at the menu f this way, you know, for the price tag. Then this, and I'd always get chicken. And I hate chicken, <laughs> but uh, I wanted the steak, but I, I didn't, right. I couldn't afford it. So, uh, and then you always look at the gas pump and. I think luxury is just signing it, not looking at the cost. Right, uh, right. That's, and then I think a lot, I'm digressing, but I think a lot of folks have a misperception of what money means. Money gives you time. Right. It doesn't a bunch of possessions you gotta dust and worry about. The only luxury having money does is give you free time to enjoy. Yep, well I'm, I'm a cheap guy too, and I think, um, for me, money gives me a little bit of freedom in the sense that little things like looking at the gas receipt, I don't worry about that, or I'll pay for a dinner in a restaurant, my wife will say, how much was that? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I, I know what the tip was, and so I can approximate it, but I don't really remember. So I do like that amount of freeing as opposed to, you know, in the old, sort of the old days when you really did care about every dime, and you had to. So your motto in the 80s, Kinko's model in the 80s was keep the music playing. Um, how did that reflect, I think I could guess, but how did that reflect on the company's culture? And what did you, you know, what did you really mean by that? Uh, the Xerox machines, I wasn't making money when the machine wasn't running. 
Same with the bowling alley. I own that bowling alley. When they're on that lane, right. that's when I'm making money. And right. what aggravates the hell out of me to this day, and I'm going to meet him tomorrow, I've had that thing for 15 years, <coughs> is how much time it takes for me to take, you go to the counter to get on the lane. At any one point in time, I have uh, 24 lanes. I would say we have a transition of uh, five lanes waiting to be revenue items. And it's up to us to constantly revise our systems, make them better and better, because that's just lost money. And unfortunately, or fortunately, we don't understand what business we're in. I was in the machine time rental business. Right. Well, the bowling alley, it doesn't sell anything. I can't sell yesterday's bowling hour. I can only sell now. So I'm in the time business. I'm managing time on machines. And that's what I did in my old business. Kinko's and bowling are the exact same businesses, running time on machines. So, so for those that don't have the, the luxury of living in Santa Barbara, um, Paul bought a local uh, bowling alley years ago, named it after a friend, or did you go in with your friend, Zotos? Yeah, Z no, I just named it after You named it after him, which is cool, right? <laughs> I used to fantasize I would drive by that old shuttered um, drive-in, which is now opened, and that was sort of my dream. Someday I'm gonna buy that and open it for Santa Barbara. But I love the fact that you, that you did that because we had two bowling alleys. I played bowling, I bowled, I didn't have a lot of money. I'd go bowling when I was growing up, something to do. And we had two in town and one closed. So was that something that you enjoyed growing up or what sort of spurred you to do that? It was the money. Really? Is there that much money in bowling? Well, I think so. <laughs> you know, you're never supposed to say you make money. I was raised where if business is good, complain. If business is bad, boast. <laughs> So it's terrible business. Don't ever think of doing it. Yeah, right. <laughs> but no, it was about the money. It's like the, it's like the bumper sticker, surfing sucks, don't try it. Yeah. <laughs> but I did it for the money. So have you... <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, I love the fact that you've got a great bar in there with all those tap craft beers, and uh, that's as much fun for me as the bowling. So, well, anyway, I'm happy you did it. Even though if you did it for the money, it's a great thing uh, for our community to have. Um, we'll get ready for the first uh, student question here. I've got one more for you. So speaking of students, you started Kinko's, as I said, right down the street. You were a student at USC at the time. You spent you know, a couple days a week, whatever, however much time you could spend there, but you weren't there all the time. Do you, recommend, do you recommend that students today start a company or start a business while they're students? Or yeah. You, okay, me too. No, 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 me no. Too. I have two answers. <laughs> I think this is a precious time in your life. Don't make yourself too busy. I think all of you, the horrible thing about George Bush, let alone the war, what he did to you in education, the no child left behind, the memorization, the busy, busy, busy. Oh, you guys are addicted to busy. I don't know if you know how to reflect and have time. Uh, what did that have to do with my comment? About starting a business. Now, enjoy these few years of relaxation. You're gonna be involved with your career for the rest of your life. Chill. But <laughs> and I don't think you know how to chill. I really don't think this generation knows how to chill. Just, and they, they studied UC, all the UCs, and they figured out which one made the most amount of money after graduation. It was UCSB, because the socialization that goes on in Isla Vista. You guys, you're doing something here. When you think you're doing some trivial BS, with sitting and having a coffee with your friends, formulating sentences, that's a skill that'll be with you for the rest of your life. Uh, now, starting your own business, I always had my own business. So in, in the summer, I uh, sold vegetables on the corner. It wasn't too employable. I had two jobs. I got fired after one day for both of them. What were your jobs? <laughs> well, I scooped ice cream. And the damn ice cream was so hard. <laughs> I went like this, and I hit my here, and I bled on the ice cream. So, Ooh. and then I... Uh, <laughs> Then the guy, I, the guy told, I couldn't read my, back in those days, the credit cards, I yeah. couldn't read my writing, so he fired me. So I, but I didn't, never thought I'd ever have a job. I could look at it, I would have reflective enough to know that employment wasn't in my cards. Right. Well, let me ask you about the 24 hours, because I thought, I thought that was interesting in your book, the way you, that and the renting of computers. So what was happening is, and one reason Kinko's was so successful is it was constantly evolving, constantly changing. It didn't just have a copier and people came in and made copies. And you experimented a bunch of things. But what I liked about your epiphany of this 24 hours, and a lot of corporations, that would have just come down from the top. You would have said, okay guys, change of plans, we're not gonna be up in 24 hours, figure it out. 
And you didn't do that. You sort of had to, cur had, you, you herded the cats to that decision. Yeah. And here's, here's something you said, though, in the book that I thought was good. You said, if I had just sort of ordered that sort of thing to happen, that would have been the best the company ever would be. In other words, okay, well, they would do that, and maybe they would do the next thing I ordered them to do, but they wouldn't be thinking of things on their own. Yeah. Uh, Did you really? You, know, you think you own a business, baloney. These folks, you got to use every little skill to get them to think it's their idea. So uh, <laughs> it took. So in the twenty-four hour instance, I tried to get somebody to go twenty-four hours. I knew if somebody just did it because I told them to, it right. wouldn't work. So I got some guy in Chicago to try it. He got up at a meeting, a manager, and said, "You know, this thing works." Now, who do you think they listen to, me or the manager? They listen to the manager. People listen to each other. So uh, we had so many fights with the field, and uh, it was just constant warfare. You know, everybody had a, it was constant. But it was constant. You had to use every skill in the book to get them to do something. And they all wanted independent thinking. You said, well, you know, I could go on a whole diatribe about that. Independent thinking versus central power. I would give you a long dissertation on that. But we, had a, we were building a business. And we needed a central authority, but we also wanted to keep the unique, cool characteristics of individual initiative. Right. What happens is a business, and you're going to find this in your life. If you don't remember one quote, remember this. You're going to find people manage their career. They don't manage the business. They're going to say, well, does this smell good with my boss? Or is this what's good for the business? Right. And uh, uh, we, as we became bigger and bigger, risk taking wasn't part of the culture. We had folks that cared about the career more than the customer, and that's something you got to really watch as a poison that infects your business. Right. And risk taking finally got taken out of the culture. We had the good old, good old uh, the non risk takers. And we had, and it, and if I fought it all the time. Yeah, well, it gets harder as you, you start out, you're hiring risk takers, you're hiring entrepreneurs, and then you start hiring people that want a paycheck every day in two weeks. Uh, so, <laughs> so one thing I thought that I liked as well when you were sitting there in IV and, you, and you know, you're pulling the copy right on the sidewalk, you realized very early on you really weren't selling copies. And this is something that's really important for anyone that starts a business. Make sure you understand what you're really selling the consumer. <laughs> So they weren't just, you know, you think of Kinko's, yeah, it's copies, right? No. <clears throat> you were assuaging people's anxiety. And you tapped into that very, very early. You realized that that's what we're doing here, so let's gear all of our efforts towards that. How did, was that just so super obvious to you, or was it something uh, that... that we had, we started, if green paint was on sale, it was in green. If it was yellow paint was on sale, every store had no consistency. Mm. Then all of a sudden, we sort of noticed our customers were uptight and confused. They didn't know, they didn't, they were upset with it themselves for not doing it yesterday, and they didn't know what the hell they wanted. And they walked in these stores and they go, wow, I got all the machines here. I'm sure they do something with these machines. So uh, if we did it in blue, which calms your anxiety, <laughs> had everything impeccably neat and orderly, guess what? Our work, and we had our workers dressed like Republicans. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, it assuaged their anxiety. We were able to raise prices. And I remember one time I went to a location. We charged eight cents a copy. The guy across the street was three cents a copy, and we had all the customers. Mm -hmm. I could never understand it. But uh, uh, you have to understand the psychology of what somebody wants. And, uh, well, he wasn't offering, he wasn't giving them what they really wanted, right? He, I mean, they walked into a Well, I would have gone there. Me? I, you would, I would have too. <laughs> Cheap. No, but I think that's a, that's a key point is really understand what's, what is that entire value proposition. It's not just three cents versus eight cents. It's the whole package. Yeah, and, so we'll take the next uh, student question. Uh, when companies first start off, they usually run into some roadblo uh, roadblocks and obstacles along the way. Uh, what would you say is a unique obstacle when you started Kinko's, Me? and how did you ever <laughs> overcome this issue? Me. Managing myself. Well, you, talk, you talk about managing your dark side. So I think yeah. the first thing is you recognize you have a dark side, and then what did you do to try to manage it? Well, I wasn't all that successful at it. Um, <laughs> you see in, leader, in business or in leadership, you have the velvet glove and the steel fist. You've got to use both. 
So there's got to be inbounds and outbounds with your workers. So when I've had a bad day and I'm really hungry before lunch, somehow I use a steel fist more, honestly. And if I could have reflected back, I would have managed my protein levels better. And I wouldn't have got so irritable before lunch. I'm serious. Uh, I just, I, I think uh, the recommendation would be to manage your nutrition, because you, we are subject to our blood sugar, and we do get irritable. And uh, I think if I reflected, I really, every time I lost my temper, it wasn't effective. Not every time, but occasionally, you gotta let them know, this is the way it is. <laughs> but you can't do it too often. If I, you know, uh, as a motivator, the steel fist is a very good short-term motivator. It's not a good long-term motivator. The velvet glove is much better. Now look at the military. They give you a feather. You can't wait to risk your life. They give you a little bit of recognition. Uh, people do a lot for recognition. You wouldn't, nobody in their right mind, you couldn't offer them enough money to attack a machine gun. But they say, hey, you got a cool medal, and guess what? You're going to attack the machine gun. People do things for different motivating factors. I'm old enough now to realize that it might be tough for me to want to attack a machine gun. At your age, you might want to do it. I just would think twice. From what I've seen of high-velocity lead, I don't think I'm going to do it. <laughs> well, there's a the story of Napoleon. So he was not the Napoleon we all know yet. He was on his way up, and his general said, there's no way you're going to get men to, to, to man that battery because it was a suicide mission, right? It was like just in a really bad place in this, in this impending um, battle. And so he put up a big banner that said, this, this battery is only for the men without fear. And he had more people than he needed. So again, it's that labeling, labeling somebody. They want to aspire to that, even when it could be to their dramatic death. detriment. <laughs> yeah. Death. But you look at very, very what people will do for recognition. Oh, sure. And uh, it's amazing. Let me ask you about But I, I don't mean to be unpatriotic. I would give up my life for this country. However, I don't really want to do it easily. Rather be in the Coast Guard. Not for a feather, right? No, maybe the Coast Guard or something like that. Right? <laughs> right. No, I think we'd all defend the country if it, was, if it came down to that. So I'm going to ask you about Xerox, and you could probably shed some light on this for me. When the first local Santa Barbara Xerox guy, you know, sold you that copier, he couldn't figure out what you were going to use it for. It didn't make any sense to him. And then for the next 30 years, you had this incredible partnership with Xerox. That, was it the innovator's dilemma? Like, why didn't they open a chain like you had. It just seems like it may, would make sense. Well, I want to answer your question in two ways. Uh, people love the machines. Everybody loves their cars, their stupid machines. The only thing you want is a repair person, isn't it? You, if the thing breaks, you want the parts and you want it to work, don't you? I didn't care about the stupid Xerox machine. I didn't even like those machines. All I knew is what came out the end I could sell. I was selling copies. I wasn't doing, I wasn't buying machines. Uh, so the repair person meant everything to me. They were selling machines. I took advantage of them so much because they were so stupid. They were thinking they were selling machines, and I was buying copies. I'll give you an example. I got in so much trouble. So I'd go to them at the end of the year, and I'd say, hey, you got those cool new machines. We want about 400 of them. It's like a $40 million order in December. <laughs> and they would say, oh, yeah. And I'd say, you know, I'll pay whatever price you want. Oh, that's cool. But the only thing is, I'd like you to extend the service for four years so I could get a repair person in there for four years, no parts, nothing. Mm. I was blasting the hell out of that machine. Four years, I got free service. Now, did, did I care about the machine? They were selling me machines. I just knew what came out the end I could sell. Right. They didn't book, because you have to know accounting. They were booking the revenue for that year. They weren't recognizing the contingent liability for four years. Right. If you could recognize, these big companies are so stupid. <laughs> and they have such a strange way of doing accounting, it's unbelievable how you can take advantage of them. And you're not taking, take advantage of them. They're just stupid. The bigger the companies are, the stupider they are, I could promise you, from my experience. Yeah. A small guy, a small person can beat the hell out of a big person any day and twice on Sunday. I can tell you still enjoy that. Well, I, <laughs> I bought buildings from big companies. I've done, they're just, you have to understand their accounting. Yeah. Yep. I would recommend only take accounting if you want to make money. It's the only reason. And you want to live a prosperous life. But any other reason than that, maybe 
don't take your calling. Well, it helps you work with the big companies. Helps you understand. Well, the I mean, mindset. everything. It's like living on Earth and not knowing oxygen. I mean, you're in the business world. You know accounting. Right. Sorry, that's yeah. the way it is. Yeah, I always say it's if you don't know accounting at a base level, it's like trying to do business in a foreign country and yeah. you don't know the language. You're and just you, too reliant on other people. And you all know the Pythagorean theorem and all this, but I don't. Th but I mean, why would you know all that nonsense if you don't know accounting? It's it's simple. I mean, it's it's very important class. So you clearly were never worried about Xerox competing with you. No, never. <laughs> uh <-uh>. Which, <laughs> which is hilarious, right? Because they should have. No, they wouldn't have known what to do. They would have had these big, big executives, and they would never manage it. Yeah, right. copies they, would have been hundred dollars would You know what happens is they manage up; they don't manage the customer. Yeah. So if they're not looking over your shoulder, like with our business, we were obsessed with customer service. An example: my variable cost was uh, sixteen cents. I sold it for a dollar. A mistake didn't cost me anything. Right. So we had a policy. When I sell, sold the business, they stopped the policy. Any counter worker could do whatever it took to take care of the customer. So the customer said, you know, you really screwed this up. We'd say, what would it take to make you happy? And the customer would say, you should give it to me for free. We would give it to him for free. Mm -hmm. Whatever they said, we would do. Right. But naturally, and they, you lose a customer if a, a counter person has to ask a big shot a simple question. Right. It's just common sense. Right. We empowered our work front line to solve whatever it took for those customers. We had a customer-obsessed business. I sold the business to these pea brains, and they completely screwed up that culture. <laughs> if I tell you, you couldn't have screwed it up more. We were totally driven on customers. And business is very simple. You all think it's complicated. Very simple. You do three things in business. Motivate your workers. What are you writing down? Motivate, workers. Motivate your workers. You can't remember this? <laughs> <laughs> You never look at these stupid notes anyway. Uh, motivate your workers, understand your customers, and balance your checkbook. That's all you do. That's all I focused on, is motivate my workers, understanding my customers, where the hell they were headed, and making sure I had money in the checkbook. And it's hard. So I was a private business, too. I didn't. We're going to get the next student question in a second. But this might not be fair for you. I got this from your book as well, the, the um, Orphala personality test. Do you remember what you had in that personality test and how you used it to recruit people? Were they drinking? Yeah. What oh. would you, you want to? Oh. Well, I don't drink anymore. But I used to take people out when I interviewed. I don't like, I'm not an office person. I don't like, I probably spent, I hated an office. I'm not a person, I get like a caged animal in an office. So when I, had to, when I wanted to work with somebody, I would take them out to dinner. And I wanted to see what they were like and how they treated waiters and waitresses. Mm -hmm. Very important. And uh, in Latin, in vito veritas, in wine there is truth. I want to see what they were like when they were drinking. And here was the kicker. What did you do last Christmas? Oh, man. I was so busy I couldn't go to Fresno to see my parents. Mm. If you don't have a good relationship with your parents, you're not going to have a good relationship with me. That was the killer test. That was the one question I looked for. And I didn't tell anybody that for a long time. But there's a special relationship you, a child has with their parents. And if you're not kind to them, that's, not, that's baggage I don't want to have to deal with. Yep. They might be right or wrong, but it's not my problem. Right. No. right. Well, UC students would have done well in that environment, just throwing a few drinks back. And... <laughs> yeah, but I, you know, after being a parent, you realize how cool. Just a little, your kid's just saying something to you. You have children? Yes. Isn't that the coolest thing you ever did? Totally. Yeah. Yep. By far, by far, it's the coolest. Dad is the cool, coolest comment I've ever got. Yep. You guys will know someday, and you guys watching know already. Many of you do. So let's go to the next student question. Uh, at what point did you know that Kinkos was going to be a success, and was there ever a point that you thought that you guys were going to fail, and if so? What steps did you take to turn it around and get you guys every back? Day, every day. <laughs> every day I thought I was going to fail. Every day. I was always across the street thinking how I was going to wipe myself out. People really liked our business. I hated it. I knew all the vulnerabilities. And I knew exactly strategically how I'd wipe myself out. So I never felt successful. I remember one time I had a good back to school. I had money in the checkbook, and I wasn't going to have to worry about the summer. 
and I was driving in from LA, and I'm thinking like really confident thoughts. I allowed myself to feel good about what I was doing. Next day, every publisher in the United States sued me for copyright violations. And I thought, you, once you get seduced by your ego, you're going to get your ass kicked. I was superstitious about it. But also, uh, you know what a paranoid is? A paranoid is the kind of person who goes to a football game, and when the players go in a huddle, he thinks they're talking about him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was fully paranoid. I knew somebody was out to wipe me out. And I was, and I, I finally saw, I was always looking. And I saw that laser printer coming at me, and I didn't know if I had a competitive answer for it. So uh, you, you always got to know your vulnerabilities. And never get seduced by your creation. Now what's the problem is, it's the only thing I ever did capably probably was Kinko's. So there was this guy, my nickname was Kinko because of my hair. I'll tell, you, if you want to hear, I'll tell you, before my nickname was Kinko, my nickname was Pubehead. You ain't go, uh, <laughs> I don't think that would have been a good brand. All right, so uh, the only thing I ever did was capably was uh, Kinko's, and I was Paul. And most men more than women, they have Venn diagrams, and they over, they, who, what they do for a living and who they are superimposes. I always had a separate distinct, I was Paul and there was Kinko. And I always tried to keep a real wall between them. And it was an advantage not to be seduced by my business. Because I was always out there knowing my weaknesses. It wasn't very comforting. It wasn't comforting. I'd had a lot of sleepless nights. So I was never sued by all of America's publishers, but I have had some experience where as soon as I thought things were just rocking and starting to feel a little good about myself, and then somebody would just come and just knock me upside the head. Just it seems like it always happens that way. Well, let me ask you this. So this, this might be a hard one. What is the, you know, there's, whenever somebody has a tremendous success and has so much notoriety and the story's so big, like your story, what are some myths or just misconceptions that you've heard about the Kinko story or about you or just things that flat out didn't happen? <laughs> Uh, I sit there, and people tell me stories about myself, and I go, you know, I was there. I don't think that's <laughs> um, uh, The myths, oh, I don't know what the myths are. Is there like a recurring Orphalus story that you're just like, dude, it never happened? But... I can't think of anything right now. Okay. But in the, in the middle of the conversation, it will, okay. my subconscious will let me Let me talk about a quote, and then we'll go to you. Let me talk about a quote of yours I like, and I used it, and I... Feel bad I didn't give you attribution the other day. Um, you said, uh, integrity is like virginity. You only lose it once. I think it's a wonderful quote. And all of you guys should think uh, twice about it and, and, and use the double entendre when you think about it. But seriously, though, I, I think it's very, very true. Because you can spend a lifetime building a reputation, a lifetime working on your integrity. And it doesn't take long to spoil it. Well, it goes to your worldview. And my worldview is this place just works, and it works well. Planet Earth and workers and our society, we stop at red lights, we go on green lights, we look at all the intricate parts of our, you cut yourself, it coagulates. I mean, there's so many interesting things about this planet. The tides go up and down predictably. More importantly, if your worldview is that people go to work to do a good job every day, you're going to find people will do a good job. Yep. The world works. We have a society based on trust. Every time I walk across the street, I have trust that somebody's not going to hit me in the car. Yep. Now, this damn Donald Trump really pisses me off when he says, I'm going to restore America to greatness. We are a great country. We never cease being a great country. We will continue to always be a great country. We have the best value system on earth, bar none. Our workers are honorable and trustworthy. We have inquisitiveness. We're in the middle of a mecca of curiosity. When I want to go back to that horrible George Bush memorizing, we have the most creative people on earth. California is the mecca for entertainment, medical research, and computers. We think, yep. and we haven't out-memorized. So uh, we live in a great society. It's unbelievably how cool it is. And anybody who tells you that cynicism. Now, what happens when you age is as you get older, you have more possessions. You're not as strong physically. 
So you view the world like, hey, well, I'm a little afraid of the world out here. Don't listen to the old people. Don't listen to Fox News. The world is a great place. It's very trustworthy. If you look at violent crime in this country, violent crime has decreased 50% in the last 20 years. Decreased 50%. Your child will be, your child is safer than they ever have been. But you talk to parents, they over hover, et cetera. This world is a very safe, successful place. And uh, I get really aggravated with all the negative dourness. Um, you get very aggravated. And I look at the developments in the world. We had the Paris Treaty. We just had a, an accord and about Syria peace process. We had India and Pakistan visit with each other. We just now have a nuclear agreement last weekend with all the major powers. I mean, the world is headed in a more peaceful, better place than it ever has been. So, uh, but if it bleeds, it leads. So. And integrity, going to integrity, uh, you can't lead a human being unless you're impeccably honest. Your workers know. Have your parents ever been able to lie to you successfully? Never. You can't lie to your children. They know it. You can't lie to a worker. They see every damn chink in your arm. If you have any impropriety or lack of integrity, your worker's going to ram it up your ass. Excuse my French. They're going to ram it up your rectum. Um, uh, you have to be impeccably honest. Pay your bills on time. And I can assure you it pays. W it were pays. you ever tempted? Did you ever, do you remember some time where you were like, ugh? Yeah, when I started business, I didn't realize how important integrity was. Yep. I compromised. Yep. But I realized, uh, uh, now, I, I didn't like these stores, Kinko stores. I didn't like being in them. My favorite thing was leaving. Now, I have two choices. If I leave, I could, who's got the last laugh? Just like the worker or the owner. The worker's got the last laugh. They can screw you over right, right. with bad customer service, lie about their hours, steal from you, whatever. And you think I'm the owner? Baloney. It's just a big act to make them feel good and want to keep the money in the till. So you have two choices with a worker. You can go like this. What is a worker going to do? They're going to hit you 10 times harder, aren't they? You mistreat them, they're going to hit you harder, harder, harder. You go like this. Happy fingers, happy registers. What a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll take the next student question. All right, so um, as said before, Forbes has listed you as one of the 100 best companies to work for in America multiple times. And I guess I was just curious as to how you create such a positive work environment. Get out of the way. Get out of the way. <laughs> just get out of the way. That's my, I studied these stores in Oklahoma, for example. Wherever the boss was, the farther away from supervision, the store did best. People like to be left alone. And every time you meddle in their affairs, you sort of destroy their morale. So I, my thing was, leave them alone. Um, get out of the way. An owner knows, has to know when to get out of the way. A good leader. Now what happens nowadays is you all feel unimportant if the people aren't pestering you in business. Constantly, busy, busy, busy. Well, that's the people, workers can figure it out for themselves. I would say the best way is leave them alone and occasionally talk to them, and they might listen. And if you're hiring the right people that want to service the customer, you know, let them service the customer. Well, see, in my business, it was easy. I just noticed in the very first store, there was a special relationship between the workers and the customer. You have a junior member of society, a college, a high school kid, and you have a bank president. And the bank president is bidding respect to the junior person and suggesting, well, if you bind it this way, da, 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 da. And the worker sees the manufacturing process and sees the end product, suggest, and then the worker saw the contribution to society. In other words, uh, what they did made a difference in people's lives. Right. All I had to do was get the hell out of that relationship. It was such a perfect relation, self-motivating relationship. Only thing I could do is screw it up by getting over and involved in it. These were self-motivated stores. So uh, in my particular business, it was easy for me to get out of the way. And it went to my strong suit. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, you're being humble, but. No, I really, well, I'm, no, I, I understand I'm, what you're saying. No, I, 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 I was never a capable person. So. Uh, 
Well, let's talk about philanthropy, because I know that's something near and dear to your heart. You've been very impactful there. Um, it, and I like your, the way you describe it is it's just very much, it's just another entrepreneurial endeavor. I think what you said is it's just the same formula of creating and delivering something of value to people. So how did that philosophy impact the Orfila Foundation's mission when you guys decided on what to focus on and then when you carried out the generous grants that you made? Well, um, we lost a child. And uh, I saw the single mothers at our work. I just kept thinking, you know, we had two loving parents, grandparents help at the house. And these kids drove. And um, how does a single mother ever do it? So I became very empath empathetic to s uh, single parents. And uh, that was, my, my, was always my pet cause, is single parents. And so uh, I just look at our society, and I think of how much go to the elderly, an intense, uh, severely Alzheimer's patient, $5,000 a night in intensive care, yet we don't give a daycare to our children. The United States and Fiji have two things in common. We both don't give paid leave for maternity. We are an uh, elderly-centric society at the expense of our children. And uh, uh, if I can remediate that in some way, in my little way, uh, what we've done in day care, early care here is uh, we have 35% accreditation for the early care facilities in Santa Barbara. Closest county to us is like 9%. Uh, we it was hard to get them to embrace play-based curriculum because mm -hmm. they all want to have safe, perfect environments for these children, but children need to be outside playing, playing, playing. So we finally got that accomplished. We've done a lot with school food. We've done gardens. If you get a child where they grow the food, see the food. And it's very important for a child to understand texture in food. So we've done a lot with that. Um, now, I think it's a if I tell you the inequities we have in our society, we have children in Santa Barbara that have never seen the ocean. Wow. If you think I'm kidding, go to Franklin School. Go to the Westside Community Center. We have children that don't know how to swim or ride a bike, yet they know the Pythagorean theorem. I can assure you of that. We have uh, the funding for Franklin School over here, poor school. And we don't think we have de facto segregation baloney. It's all Hispanic. $7,200 a year per student for Franklin School. We have Cleveland School, the same thing. We have McKinley, the same thing. Montecito Union, $28,000 a year of state funding per student. If you think I'm wrong, look these numbers up. We are a society that are neglecting our children, our have-nots, and we think, all these foxaholics think, well, they should be getting these things at home. If these two parents are working as intently as they are, how in the hell can they ever get to the beach, ride a bike, or swim? You got my pet peeve here. Uh, and I don't think I've done enough. I think children have a basic fundamental right to orthodonture. I can't believe a better investment in society than orthodonture for children. I, how can you go through life without a proper smile? Mm. You can't be in a service business. You can't do sales. You can't... So uh, I'm trying to, in my own little way, try to remediate that problem. But uh, well, I, I, I just think of all the possessions and nonsense I have at the expense of, why should I have it? And I remember one time I, was, I had my fancy car and I was talking to one worker in San Antonio. She had five kids. And I could think, why do I get so much more than her? Uh, I don't know. Just there's something. If you think... Yeah. So what do you, what, what kind of causes would you want to see young people with all their energy and all their enthusiasm and intelligence, what are some, what are some suggestions? Best or, thing, go sorry, ahead. I interrupted. Best thing you can do is get involved in school, mentor in a classroom. I did it at 36th Street School at SC. I learned so much just sitting in the classroom trying to motivate these young kids. It's a skill you'll all use for the rest of your life. Isla Vista School, 57% of the students there are in free and reduced lunch. Enough poverty there. There's another school over here in Goleta that's got some good poverty. Uh, go in those schools. Just say, I'd like to volunteer. Get in that classroom. Give of your time, not of your money. Uh, you'll get a lot out of it. And uh, 
you get a lot out of it. I like, I like my causes. I just don't think, and I don't really expect to die with a bunch of money. I want to give it all away, I hope. So you're sunsetting the Orville Foundation. That's, That's already happened. closed. That's closed. That's happened. Yeah. What is, what's the next phase? Just keep, I'm is doing it, it do anonymously. I'm doing it anonymously. Anonymously? Okay. Yeah. I'm tired of the recognition. I, don't, I think you'd, I'd be pretty screwed up if I looked in the mirror and didn't have enough ego or enrichment. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't have enough of it's this. It's the same. My mother would kick my ever-loving ass if she really? came alive. And she said, saw all the attention I got from society. She would really be pissed. Well, I think she'd be proud. She'd be proud, but she thinks she got too much attention, honey. No, I know exactly what she'd tell me. She's right. <laughs> what do I need it for? Get kidnapped? I don't need all this. Let's, let's hope not. I don't want anybody watching this getting any ideas. It, so do you see the same focus that you had before, the same areas of, of giving? If, if uh, uh, lactation is very important. We have donated the lactation centers here. It's funny, you talk to these architects that are building buildings 20 years ago. I'd say, wow, have you ever thought of putting in a lactation room? What? Now it's common. Right. I hope it's more common. Right. But uh, right. we have got to be a more family-friendly society. We're elder-centric. Elderly are taking too damn much out of society. If you think I'm kidding, you, you look at your student loans. Well, how in the hell are you going to ever, ever have your head above water with these loans? I mean, you're going to get out of the world and you have non-deductible uh, loans on your... Uh, you're gonna, how are you ever going to get your head above water? I, I, yet, elderly have wonderful restaurants, golf courses. All my peer group have every luxury on the face of the earth, better, great medical care, all that. And you have all that loans and you're tomorrow. And we're yesterday. Speaking of the youth versus the elderly, if you were 22 years old today, or if you were 21, 22, sitting in this classroom, what do you think you would be pursuing? Like, what technologies would you want to go after? Oh. What would your path be? I'd probably, uh, once again, you go around, the world is full of success. Full of success. Just keep your eyes open. Now, is there a technology today that uh, you would think, oh, I don't know, I, was I don't have emails. Younger or? You're talking to a guy that doesn't have email. I don't like. I don't know that. So, uh, I guess you guys have got a tremendous vantage point because that whole area of the world just passed me by, computers and all that. Um, but we—if you view the world as a fundamentally successful place, how many of you have ever been to Top Dog in Berkeley? What did you notice? People in line, right? Was that screaming success? I'm successful. Come compete with me. Did you, ever, did you ever think that when you saw it? I did. Uh, we are surrounded by success. Now, we have some mythology in this country. Do you remember? You're too young to remember, and I don't either. How did the commie bastards get our atomic bomb? Do you remember the folklore <laughs> story? The folklore was that these vicious spies stole it from us in Alamogoso, New Mexico. That's the folklore. You know how it got given? You know how it was given to the... Uh, commie bastards. <laughs> it exploded. The world said, you know, I think they got a bomb over here that works. We are surrounded by success. Every page, every time you drive down the street, you buy something, it's success. Every time you see somebody in line, that's success. Understand why. We used to piss me off in my business. I'd drive around and I'd say, well, tell me about the competition. It's oh, they're horrible. Nobody yeah, likes right, it. Right, right. I say, damn it, if they have one customer doing something right, I want to learn from them. What did you learn from them? Yep. And uh, so there's success everywhere you look in this world, especially in this wonderful country of ours. No, I mean, that's an important lesson for entrepreneurs. You want to relish the strengths of your competitors and, and be open about you know, what they do well. You're still going to beat them. You're still going to work really hard. But don't just dismiss them. Don't write them off. That's a mistake. We'll take the next student question. How did you develop trust in your employees so that as your business grew from a small one to a national one, you're able to have confidence that the company was on the right track? And how much did your dyslexia and ADHD impact needing to trust others with important tasks? It's a two-part question. Yeah. 
uh, what was the first part? So building trust. How did you build trust in the organization? I had no choice. I'm not a capable person. I can't read well. I'm not mechanically inclined. Uh, I can't fix a machine. I can't. So uh, if you can't fill out a form or not mechanical, you have to find trust. What else am I going to do? I was going to have my own business. And then I'm Lebanese. Anybody here know anybody Lebanese? Do you know anybody Lebanese that has a job? No, they don't. They have their own business. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not, I mean, my peer group was different than yours, but nobody I knew in my parents' house ever had a job. So uh, uh, how did I develop trust? I had no choice but to trust. I was capable enough to do it myself. And my motto has always been anybody else can do it better. Mm. So uh, and I'm, in my case, it's true. I find other people do things much better than I do. And I'm fundamentally lazy. I'll tell you a story about how I view work. My brother's in the Army. And this guy did everything so perfectly. Very, and he was in bed before everybody else. And my brother said, God, you must really love the Army. And he said, no, I hate the Army. I want to go to bed early. Why do you work? You go to work so you can enjoy the money and go to bed and enjoy your life. I don't go to work so I can just enjoy work. I want to have the fruits of my labor and enjoy it. And I enjoy the giving part now a lot. I'm not into the, I have a fancy car and all that nonsense, but it doesn't mean that much to me. So who are your idols when you're growing up? I know your parents were a huge influence, obviously, but beyond your parents, did you have idols either public figures or people in your life that you, you know, that you idolized, and how did you apply what they taught you in your business? Uncle Nick and Uncle Emil. Really? Yeah. Uncle Nick and Uncle Emil come back from the war. They're bartenders. They start, they save their money. I told you it's very important, this saving your money. So they saved their money. Then they bought a bar. Then they bought another bar. Then they bought liquor stores. Then they got some money out of the business and started buying real estate. And so when they were 50, they sold all their bars and all that and just had paid off real estate. And their biggest, my mother would say to them, don't you want to end up like them? Their biggest decision is where am I going to eat lunch today? Nice. Don't you want to have that as the toughest decision all day? What do I feel like? Italian. <laughs> uh, so those were my idols. And I, they managed their savings properly and they managed their life properly. And Uncle Nick never missed a meal with his children. Mm. And they were very good fathers and very so were they, obviously they were an influence growing up. Once you started your business, did you, did you lean on them for advice? Or was it all just... Yeah. Yeah? And they were Uncle helpful? Nick was a bartender. And he looked at a table that I was obsessed with in the store. And he goes, that's the, and nobody ever noticed this. He said, that's the most important table in the store. Because there's a work table. Everything organized itself around it. Mm. And uh, bartenders know. If you ever want to study efficiencies in motion, work, look at a bartender. They know to, when they're downtime, they put in the glass. Very, very, uh, you see, if you keep observing, you're going to find a lot of uh, people doing things right in society. Yep. But I could bring up something parallel. Sure. My job at Kinko's was going store to store to store looking for what people are doing right. I can make a lot more money from what people are doing right than hovering in that office Absolutely. and looking at what people are doing wrong. Yep. Uh, and how many hours, you've heard this before, how many hours a day can you all work in this room? Can you work 20 hours a day, 18 hours a day? Guess what? Your savings and your ideas work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. <laughs> Do you think I liked it when I went to bed and I woke up from my nice slumber and I had more money in the checkbook than I went to bed with? Is that a nice way to sleep? Do you want to sleep like that? Save your money, work with your ideas. Yep. It's not real mysterious. Now, oh, I love to tell these guys this. Can I go up parallel? You're dating a beautiful gene pool, absolutely exquisite gene pool. Picks you up in the nicest, newest car. Takes you to the most expensive restaurant. Says all those beautiful things, and you're just, then all of a sudden, the person gives a credit card, and it bounces. That's gene pool A. Gene Pool B, they show up in a modest car, takes you to a pizzeria, and talks about maybe being ambitious. Which Gene Pool do you like better, A or B? Is it B? Yeah, okay. Now, what do you think, you male macho studs? They're trying to say, 
I want somebody financially trustworthy. I want somebody secure. That's, so you want to you go like this with the future, in your case, some, I can't see it now, but you want to uh, kiss somebody, you go like this. I save my money. <laughs> <laughs> you got another gene pool. Uh, you take the person to the lovely, lovely dinner orders the most expensive thing in the menu, steak and lobster. And when the bill, when she doesn't even eat it, she's maybe two bites, what do you think of her? You think she's using you, right? You're always looking for signals of trustworthiness in other human beings. And how many of you want a friend that's not trustworthy? I promise you, young folks, you will fall in love with somebody that's bad for you. No. <laughs> I promise you at your age it'll happen. And you'll know it, and you'll still be in love. I promise as night follows day, you'll be in love with somebody that's bad for you. It won't be, and that's the fun one. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the good relationships. Well, I had a similar sort of joy in a certain part of my career with, um, when it came to tracking the financial results. And this is something I, I, I impress upon students. It's great to get a, a, a company going that makes money as you sleep. So we were selling go to meeting and go to my PC, and, and I would have this little thing on my computer, and I'd wake up in the morning, and it wasn't like I ran to my computer, but at some point in the morning, I would click on refresh, and it would, go, and it would show me all the sales we had as the sun went around the globe while I rested my weary soul. So that's what you want, believe me, because it's a great way to start my day. You just lovely having money in the checkbook. I was not in business to be an altruist. I wanted the money. And I used to work with all my folks. I'd have to tell them, guess what? We're going to do it for the money. <laughs> and I'd say, guess what? I, tell, I told them a story about my mom. I didn't get married until I was 36 years old. So okay. My mother would say, when are you going to get married, have your family, you know, start, life doesn't begin until you have your family and children, blah, 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 blah. So I'd say to my mom, you know, mom, I'm tired of you asking me when I'm going to get married. So she said, from now on, when I look at you, you'll know what I'm thinking. <laughs> so I told them that, and I said, from now on, you know I'm thinking about profits. And believe it or not, my best stores have the highest, most satisfied workers and best, cust best satisfied customers. You could plot them, and they made the most profits. There's not a sin about making money. Not a sin. I had to convince a lot of folks that. that it's not a sin. Amen. <laughs> well, I wish we had more time. We could go on for a couple of hours without a doubt. But unfortunately, we're out of time. I do oh, appreciate it, Paul. Thank you so much. Can I give you my last piece of wisdom? Yes. There's only one measure of success in life. That is, your children want to be with you when you're an adult. Nice. Remember that. He is right. Thanks, Paul.